Hi, greetings, it's me, Dr. Paul Gerhardt, and today I wanted to talk about some of the essentials about teamwork. Let's face it, uh, no matter whether or not you're working on a virtual team or if you're a professor in a classroom, somehow you are always working on a team. And what we know about teaming is that when more people get together and they could fluently share their ideas, there's greater innovation and creativity that is, comes as the result. The very definition of synergy is that uh, the outcome equals more than the sum of its parts. And that's a really powerful statement. If you think about it, if there's high levels of trust in a team and people are effectively communicating, then together they come to conclusions a lot quicker and uh, they're able to harness and leverage the diversity of that team. So let's talk about some of the basics of teamwork and teams. So teams really involve working together to achieve something beyond the capabilities of what individual could do on their own. Organizations today are based on teams, every type of organizations. And being a team player requires high levels of emotional intelligence. Being a, a team player is the second most sought after skill of any employers. And so learning how uh, to communicate and uh, the personal skills that you have are two of the other uh, most important skills that people look for. We're talking about virtual teams. And there are all sorts of teams, but in virtual teams, essentially people are finding ways to do their work electronically or digital with their communication. Uh, they use tools like Groupware that's designed to uh, transfer documents at the same time. Um, I like to use Google Hangouts because it's free, and it seems like Google is such a powerful company that they're always updating their technology. Uh, one of the challenges of virtual teams is developing trust. So when you are uh, an, a leader of a team, you really have to know how to flush out effective teamwork. And it truly can be challenging when you're working on virtual teams, especially when you're doing it with people who are, come from different countries from all around the world. Let's talk about the essential teamwork formula. So the teamwork formula is a team's performance is based on its structure, the dynamics, and the stages of, of the team development. So essentially, that's TS plus TD equals SOD equals TP. So team's performance is TP. TS is team structure. And TD is uh, team development. And so and stage of development is SOD. So, TS plus TD plus SOD equals TP. Uh, a term that you have to be a f uh, familiar with is the systems effect. Let's face it, every individual on a team affects everybody else and essentially it affects the organization's team. I mean, the saying that you've all heard is the a team is only as strong as its weakest link. And it's true. I, whenever I'm on a team, I never want to be that weak link. And I know that some people just don't care. So um, your job as a leader is to really help motivate people and get them to, to care. It just takes one person to bring down the effectiveness of a team. So I'm a big fan of when uh, a team is not as effective as it can. I'm a firm believer that it is the leader who needs to be able to help move that team into a uh, better position and they do that by addressing and building, addressing challenges and building uh, teams performance. Team structure is really important. There are essentially four different parts of team structure to consider. Leadership. Uh, I continue to talk about it in each of my videos. Uh, you're a leader really needs to know what to look for and take the right actions at the right time and they need to know what they don't know and they need to be approachable. So if you have a team that is a, a team leader that's approachable and they are constantly 
praising good work when it's when good work is done never praise bad work and then coaching people when they need a little bit of support and making sure that people always are on the same page and they know what's expected uh, that's what a good team leader does composition of the team uh, do you have the right members on the team? What does the diversity of your team look like? It's, we're talking about functional and technical skills. Do they? What is it that they bring to the party, so to speak? Uh, tech, diversity enhances performance. You make better decisions, and you have greater innovation than homogenous teams. So make sure that you've got enough diversity on your team, people with the right skills, abilities, and backgrounds, and you as a leader know how to leverage that to bring out the best. Uh, teams must have problem solving and decision making skills. This is absolutely important. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to make better decisions and solve problems. And they need to have good conflict management skills. Let's face it, if there's no conflict and everybody sees things differently, then it's probably a leadership problem because people are too scared to share their differences of ideas. So uh, managing conflict means recognizing that you don't want to harm anybody and you want to be able to include people and be able to solve conflicts in a way that creates win-win solutions. So you probably heard me talk about, if you've watched other videos, this powerful philosophy of thinking win-win, which means really understanding other people. So I'm a firm believer of the platinum rule versus the golden rule. The platinum rule just assumes that everybody is the same. You think like me. Well, that's stupid. None of us think exactly the same, so why would you want to treat people in a way that they don't want to be treated? And that brings me to the platinum rule. The platinum rule essentially says treat people as they want to be treated, so that really means there's enough communication going on where you really get to know and understand the preferences of the people that are on your team. Simple enough, right? So team dynamics are really important. You know, we need to be able to look at group processes. And so essentially we are talking about patterns of interactions that emerge as the group and team develops. And uh, if you are want to have a high paying job or you have been selected to a high paying job, it's probably because you have really good team dynamic skills. Uh, most people have little or no training working in teams and so it's really nice when you get into an educational program that really teaches you how to be more effective in a team. Well, not everything is going to go as expected, but you learning how to stay into a team and then navigate it effectively uh, can help you develop better team uh, skills. So uh, essentially there are six parts of group dynamics and we're going to look at each one of these. Um, these team dynamics or group dynamics are objectives, size, norms, cohesiveness, status, and roles. So for objectives, uh, let's talk about it. It's about setting goals and you have to be very very clear on what the objectives or goals are. Uh, everybody must be committed to achieving them. You know, they've got not just half in, fully committed. And they want to make certain that uh, the goals are their priorities. The team members count too. Uh, people must find a way to work towards consensus of commitment towards these goals. And without goals, everyone would be, uh, would be floundering around essentially. So having very, very clear goals and objectives is important. Size matters, and I'm talking about teams. So the bigger the team, uh, the more challenging it gets to be able to uh, benefit from the diversity. So smaller teams can be easier to manage. Functional groups probably should be around 14 to 15 people. Task groups are ideal at five, but anywhere between three and nine. And when you have really large teams, things can move slower or need to move slower in order to get people on the right track, but because there's going to be more ideas that, that are emerging. With larger teams, you really have to have more structure. Uh, leaders need to be more autocratic and a little more formal. And so more direction really helps benefit 
um, larger teams. With smaller groups, the leaders really should be more informal and participative in their leadership style, you know, involving other people in the decision making processes. And generally, uh, equal participation uh, should be expected from all members. Uh, me managers and leaders should use the appropriate leadership style for the size of your group. With norms, you have to remember that norms are expectations of members' behavior. Uh, if you've watched my video on ethics, uh, you know that ethics are absolutely important. Ethics are doing the right thing for the right reasons with the people that you're interacting with, whatever that community is. If it's your team, you should know what's expected and then work within those norms. Failing to do so uh, can create hard feelings and can slow things down and it could ruin your levels of trust. Trust equals speed. Uh, so you are always being tested. Are you, are you doing what's expected? Do you understand the group norms? And so we all have to be aware of what those groups norms are and make sure that we're helping each other work either change the norms together as a team or work within those teams and be a little more compliant. We can do that through peer pressure if we all have you know the same equal levels of titles within a team. So you can't ridicule, ostracize, or sabotage or physically abuse for that sake anybody on your team. You know we have to be respectful in bringing people back into a team. Remember relationships are fragile. So with cohesiveness uh, you have to uh, really work to help people um, be attracted to each other professionally and be close as team members and um, the, you have to make sure that uh, you are respecting people for who they are and you're continually being tested and the, the more respect that you can help uh, develop uh, the more cohesive a team can be so uh, try to be as positive as possible and have an open mind and depend with, in working with each team member it really helps uh, make the team more cohesive uh, some factors that you should consider regarding cohesiveness are objectives. You know, the stronger of the agreement and commitment of, of the team objectives, uh, the more cohesive a team will be. Size, as we talked about, affects cohesiveness too. The smaller the size of the team, generally speaking, the more cohesive they are. The larger the team, uh, the chances are it's going to be a lot more difficult. Uh, homogeneity really has to do with people who uh, are, are closer to the same. Get along with people who have similar values than us. Uh, but that is a challenge because when, if everybody on your team is very similar or homogeneous, then uh, we have to recognize that less diversity means less creativity. So we don't always know what we don't know and when you have people who have different backgrounds it helps us see things differently which means we do things differently which means we get better different results, right? So some factors that influence cohesiveness is participation. The more equal the participation, the higher the cohesiveness. Uh, domination by one or few tends to make members feel excluded. We want to make everybody feel included. Uh, competition or intergroup competition uh, lowers the level of uh, cohesiveness. So help people accomplish things within your team. You know when you get done with something show that you care, give credit to the whole team and you got everybody's back, help other people out. Uh, the, the more you win the stronger the cohesiveness. So more successes with your team probably will help generate more successes. So uh, success breeds success, right? You can't deny that status is something that people are always thinking about in the back of their minds. So sometimes it has to do with job titles or seniority or how much people make or areas of expertise, uh, education, race, gender, 
uh, appearance, all of these things affect how people perceive people and, and may be people according to status. Uh, it does face, uh, affect team performance. So uh, as a leader, you have to be able to facilitate respect among people and help everybody feel genuinely included. You know, we talked about Groening's um, LMX theory in another video that I have posted online. You know, there shouldn't be out groups and in groups. Everybody should feel like they are included. So there should be status congruence. People should feel accepted. They should f equally feel job satisfaction as, as a member of their team. People should feel happy about who they're working with. And when there's hurt feelings, that, could, that causes things to not work as well. So we all need to help people feel included and genuinely valued. People have to be very clear on what their roles are and what's expected of them as it relates to their roles. When you change your roles, you change your goals. So having very, very clear um, definitions of who you are within your group and making sure that you're meeting the expectations of other people as it relates to your role is uh, important too. If you think about the fa your family unit, you just expect no matter how, you, how old you are that where you are in your family role that kind of has to do with what's expected of you. So with task roles, these are things that group members do or say directly to aid in the accomplishment of, of the objectives. So you've got to have objective clarifiers. You know, make sure everyone understands the goal. Planners need to determine how the goal will be met. Organizers are the ones who are assigning and coordinating the resources. The leaders influence others by directing what goes on and then there'll be controllers and the controllers take corrective action to make sure that the goal is met uh, and keeping people on target. Um, there are um, always going to be maintenance roles that take place and uh, the, in teaming there are formers. These are the people who get the members involved and are committed. Consensus seekers, these are the people who get members input and agreement on decisions. Harmonizers uh, help resolve conflict with other members. Gatekeepers see the appropriate norms are developed and enforced. Encouragers are uh, supportive and friendly. And compromisers get members to adjust their position to gain cohesiveness. Maybe you see yourself in some of these roles as you naturally act within teams. So uh, there are people with self-interest roles on all sorts of different types of teams. And these are people who say things to get their own needs or goals met at the expense of the team. Um, they may be aggressors who deflate other people's status with negative criticism and put other people down. There may be blockers. These people resist group effort and try to prevent the team from meeting its goals. They're recognition seekers and these people try to take credit for the group's accomplishments and then there are withdrawers, people who physically or mentally are not involved in the group and are more concerned about their personal matters. So if you are any of these you probably are really the weak link on the team. So don't make him weaker, make your team stronger. And if you're a leader, you need to recognize that people may be filling each of these different roles and you've got to find systems for managing those. There are five stages of development that teams go through from beginning until the, the team terminates. And as you look at these teams, and almost everybody knows these uh, very famous team stages, but I'll talk about them. Uh, it really is important to understand that as a leader you need to recognize what style of leader you, you need to be for each stage of uh, development that your team is in. So with orientation the leader really must be more autocratic. This is the forming stage as we, as we often call it and roles and goals must be clearly defined. Uh, the storming stage, uh, the, the leader must be more consultative 
and because there's dissatisfaction among your team and that's and uh, learn people are learning about each other and building trust and um, on starting to understand each what each other can bring to the team so the consultative approach is uh, the second stage that a team goes through the storming stage and so leaders need to be consultative um, when the norming stage is going along uh, the leaders just need to be participative and uh, in that norming stage relationships are built affiliations are made norms are set and people are really learning how to work together in the performing stage or production stage the leader then becomes laissez-faire or more hands-off you know the commitment is high and performance is taking place in the team so why mess up a good thing you know people know each other's roles and and what they can do best and so problems and conflicts are are quickly uh, being resolved and members are open to working with each other so the leader really should just keep their hands off and just allow things to emerge and respect the what people are bringing and in the termination stage uh, this is the adjourning stage uh, things kind of people are going their own ways and so um, nobody stays on a team forever and ever and ever or very rarely I should say so you got to be aware of how to be an effective leader in that in that type of position so uh, planning meetings meetings are always an important part of moving goals forward uh, you have to have goals written goals where everybody can be on the same page so make sure that people are very clear what the meeting is about you can't have a meeting just have a meeting you know people's time is valuable most people want to accomplish things but let's face it uh, meetings if they're well structured really can help things move uh, quicker so uh, people need to understand who and what is going to be taking place so you should have a, a written agenda of things that are going to be covered I like having times on my agendas for when how long we're going to discuss things you know and you have to be very clear on the date and time you know start to finish and the location if you're on a virtual team um, you've got to make sure you've got the address to uh, the whatever uh, software that you're using maybe it's WebEx or maybe it's Skype or what whatever the go-to meeting whatever the 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 platform that you're using and then when you're conducting the meeting respect people's time you know begin on time uh, review progress cover the agendas items stay on task summer, summarize and review assignments and end on time uh, that's uh, kind of the golden rule is make sure you respect people's time so get commitments from people uh, for assignments record all assignments encourage accountability and then follow up on them. That accountability thing is so important in teams. When you have problem members, we need to skillfully, as leaders, help bring them into the team so that they can be more effective. And we need to find a respectful, tactful way of doing that. Sometimes you'll have people who are silent members and they tend you need to really be able to make them feel included by drawing out their input and helping them understand how their input truly does contribute to the team sometimes you have people who just like to talk and then they'll dominate the conversations and so you have to be kind of skillful in not alienating them but also help them uh, help them understand you know that other people have opinions too that need to be considered uh, you can have people who are wanderers that uh, like to complain or criticize and want to socialize and get off track essentially so if you have those people that are there find a way to tactfully get them back on track uh, sometimes there'll be people who are bored they may be know-it-alls so uh, when you're working with these people um, help try to keep them interested and active you know ask questions of them sometimes you have people who just like to argue so if you've got that arguer in there uh, you should never 
uh, argue with people in a group. You know, can't allow personal attacks. Stay focused on the goal. Maintain your uh, way of being so it's calm, cool, and collected. Set a respectful, professional tone, of course. And then you'll have social loafers. And these are people who just ride essentially on the backs of everybody else's hard work. And so uh, these people, uh, you, you really have to be proactive and get them involved. You know, so when working with people, again, don't embarrass people, don't intimidate people, don't argue with people, um, even if you're being provoked. You know, you must be a leader that people will always respect. And so take the high road, uh, help maintain a sense of professionalism. You know, you set the tone as a leader. And so if there are serious problems with members that don't respond to your positive te techniques, you got to have a private meeting and help gain their support and cooperation. They are the weak link on your team. Don't tell them that. Don't insult them, but help them come to the conclusion that they're not being helpful in what they're doing. When you are problem solving, you, it, everything is related to decisions. It's not what happens to us, it's what we choose to do. And so the better we get at problem solving, uh, the better uh, outcomes that we can have. And not everything will always go the same. But when you have high trust teams, people can identify what the problem is and then take the right corrective actions in order to stay on track or get back on track and accomplish goals. And so people in teams may find ways to be able to look at the alternative ideas that are involved. And then problem solve. You don't always know what you don't know, but it is pretty amazing how when you, if there's good leadership, who really understands how to facilitate effective communication, that it may be easier to come to conclusions. So essentially, these here are the steps for problem solving. It's not rocket science. One, you have to define the problem. If you can't solve it, you don't know what the, what it is, you gotta separate the symptoms from the cause. If you don't cure the cause, it's gonna continue to reoccur. So be very clear on defining the problem. Step two, set objectives and criteria. You know, setting the goal uh, is vital. Uh, you need to understand us and the wants and create a list. Uh, and, and then be able to, uh, next, be able to generate alternatives. Start thinking of ideas or methods or other choices to use to solve the problem. There's usually then more than one way to do things. So have a plan A, B, and C. Uh, step four, analyze alternatives. Pick one. Try to um, really think about what would be the best cost-benefit uh, return. And then five, plan, implement, and control. So just do it. So step one, define the problem. Step two, uh, under set the objectives and criteria. Step three, generate alternatives. Step four, analyze alternatives. And step five, plan, implement, and control. And otherwise, just do it. All right, in the creativity process, um, this sometimes it takes time to, uh, to harness the creativity that's in a team. So the, the more trust there is, the more creativity that comes out. So creativity is develop, the ability to develop unique alternatives to solve problems. I hate the term thinking outside of the box, but you're, you're looking at things from multiple ways and you're giving it a try. With innovation, it's the actual application of the creative ideas. So um, it really is important to put a little bit of pressure in order to come up with the best decisions to innovate, creating something new. So you do this creative uh, processing in essentially four different stages. There's the preparation stage where you get familiar with the problem, you get the facts, you ask others what it is, you get their ideas and feelings, and you look for an unusual angles. And you, you try not to set any limits or boundaries. Then step 
two or stage two is possible solutions. Do some brainstorming. Look for as many solutions as possible without passing judgment. Incubation, you know, take a break. We work better when we have a fresh mind. Uh, I would love to, to believe that we work best after we get a good night's sleep. So make sure that you get some insight and never make decisions when you're tired. This is my rule of thumb. And then evaluation. Once you choose your course, think it through and then make sure that it works. So essentially, um, you can come to better uh, conclusions when you do a brainstorming process. You know, you're generating lots of alternatives and uh, you should have some ground rules. One, get as many ideas as possible. Um, so quantity should be a good rule. More and more and more and more ideas, the better. Two, when you're getting a bunch of ideas, you need to keep them flowing, so make sure that there's no criticism. You know, hold your own evaluation of what's going on and just allow people to share ideas openly without criticism. Then think outside of the box, you know. Um, really dig deeper and think about what other things could be involved that might, you know, in an ideal world, help solve this problem. And then build on ideas uh, that people are presenting, you know. Try to see if you can make other ideas work. And then really write things down along the way so that uh, maybe you might have to take a few steps back, but you've got some things that uh, you can take a look at to help. So there really are advantages and disadvantages in group decision making. So on the pro side, the advantages are better decisions. You help avoid errors with people. I like to play devil's advocate. Um, you have more choices. Um, you have greater acceptance and commitment, and you have higher morale levers, levels, better job satisfaction. Uh, when I talk about organizational change, when you're involving people, people become more committed. The cons is it does take time to do group decision making right. Um, sometimes there are people who become dominant in groups, and so you have to be able to work, work with them. Uh, Groupthink is something that very often emerges. You know, people s get trapped in just going with one idea that they're missing out on other alternatives. So make sure that there is not that conformity. And then responsibility is important. You know, people uh, should be accountable for participating and doing their fair share. So in this world where we will undoubtedly sooner or later be working on teams that look different than us, have different cultural beliefs than us, we must learn to help build cohesive teams that are respectful to people's differences. We have to understand people's different cultures, especially individualistic versus uh, collective cultures, and be able to use the technology that's available to be able to communicate in effective ways that build trust, that help people feel like they're generally uh, included and understood. All right, I've talked longer than I had planned on, so I hope that I've given you some things to consider as you work a team or lead a team. And more importantly than this, I hope that you have a great day because only you get to choose how you feel about it. I'm Dr. Paul Gerhardt.